I'm very glad I could come back this year to Boulder. Last year was the first time in many, many years that I came here for this uh, Lambda conference. And uh, it was a very fine experience. And we got to see my wife and I a number of old friends here in town because in the last century, I used to come to Boulder quite often because there were very uh, related people to my work in logic, in mathematics, and also in uh, computer science. And especially one old friend who's, alas, moved away to another town after retirement, Angie Ehrenfeucht, uh, I met already many, many years ago in Warsaw. And then he emigrated to the States and was here in Boulder for uh, quite a long time. He started out in logic and then uh, turned to finite combinatorics. That's, that was his role in uh, computer science department. And uh, Andre was a very, I would say, laid back character. He really didn't care about a number of niceties. And one time I was visiting here and he said, oh, I'm so glad the department opened a new building and now I have an empty office. <laughs> because he would get papers and junk mail and everything. It would pile up on his desk. <coughs> And then at a certain point, a mountain of it would slough off into the floor, and he paid absolutely no attention uh, to the accumulation. So one day he was working late at the office and forgot to turn out the lights when he went home. And so at 3 o'clock in the morning, the security guard saw the lights on in the office and opened it up to see what was going on. And so Aaron Foyt got this call, Professor Aaron Foyt, Prof Come quickly, your office has been ransacked. <laughs> he told that story on himself and was very, very pleased uh, to do that. <laughs> so, uh, one more interjection about Aaron Freud. Any of you are rock climbers, uh, that's a you know, big thing here in Boulder. Many of the routes uh, in Boulder Canyon are his first ascents. So. People can have lots of interesting hobbies. That's right, yeah. <laughs> no, and there are a lot of other people here that uh, he used to climb with. It was quite a... One of the reasons he came to Boulder, I'm sure. Uh, so, Jeremy came to Boulder for his... Uh, uh, about four or five years ago, he was uh, left for Indiana to get his next appointment, but he was seven years here as... Uh, assistant professor, so he knows a lot of the mountains uh, as well. And the way that we met was extremely lucky for me because I decided this year to go to Popol in Los Angeles in uh, January, and I noticed in the program that <coughs> someone was speaking about a possible future for denotational semantics. So I wrote him and uh, suggested that we meet up, and I went to his talk, which was very nice, and we had great discussions together, and really I felt we were on pretty much the same kind of uh, wavelength, and his, he had uh, this strong interest in the theoretical background. So I suggested that he uh, uh, join me here as co-presenter for, uh, for this workshop, and uh, uh, John DeGos and the people were very glad uh, to be able to invite him, and he's have a session uh, tomorrow. Uh, of, his, of his own. But there's one thing that I have to say about Jeremy. <laughs> is he ever a nitpicker? He has been a thorn in my side. We have hundreds of emails. Why did you say that? Why did you write that? Why did you use that notation? Why? Why? Oh, oh, Jeremy, that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to arrange for the creation of a merit badge in nitpicking <laughs> to be awarded to Jerry, Jer Jeremy, and I'm sure he will be the champion nitpicker of state of Indiana because he certainly has had a lot of practice. Now, nitpicking is a very serious thing th these days. With all the tweeting and fake news and terrible comments in the newspapers 
and those idiot talking heads on television, nitpicking is really essential for national security, uh, if you'll just listen to me about that. It's very, very something I wish the Department of Justice would get some background and pass some really strong laws protecting nitpicking. <laughs> and so what I want to say is that we have to do this in order to really preserve the nature of our government here. So please remember the importance of nitpicking. I'll tell you that as very something that you ought to know about. Thank you for that opportunity to give that speech. <laughs> so here in our uh, session, first I'm going to start with some historical background about uh, lambda calculus. And just in very simple-minded terms, a key question is, is it, does it really make sense to have some kind of type-free theory of functions? What's type-free about it is that a function can apply to anything. And we'll see what that means. In other words, you don't make a distinction between the operators and the arguments. Does it make sense to do that? Now, of course, in the, uh, uh, back in the 19th century, Frege tried to have a type-free theory of sets. And of course, he thought of functions uh, too. And he didn't worry about types. But when you combine it with logic, it often leads to contradiction if you're too free and easy about how you combine things, as you know from Russell's paradox. But later on, it turned out that there was a way of having a certain amount of algebra of type-free functions where you don't have to make the distinction between operators and arguments. Uh, and uh, can we relate that to the more familiar things that we think about in terms of types, and uh, of course we want to know what good it is. Fortunately, a student of Haskell Curry, Roger Hindley, together with a with a, a colleague, wrote up an amazingly comprehensive history of lambda calculus that covers all kinds of uh, logical. Uh, all kinds of historical background where things came from. Wait, and I'll show you here. So in the background folder, in the background folder, uh, these are sort of in alphabetical order. You can find the uh, paper of uh, Cardoni and Hindley, and it just has an amazing, amazing weight. There's a lot of introduction, but then it has a lot of uh, bibliography. Where the hell is it? OK. All kinds of exposition about history of where lambda calculus came from and how it's used. So I hope you'll find that uh, interesting. So now I'll go back to here. I strongly recommend <clears throat> to find background. And of course, one of the good things about a, a compilation like uh, Hindley's, you know, it's, uh, it's back in 2009. Uh, but with just a few names and a few key words, Google Scholar turns up amazing amounts of information if you're looking for things. I don't even have to go to the library anymore. I sit at home. I find out things. And I have a VPN connection to the University of California Berkeley Library. And most of the journals and things like that with subscriptions there allow you to get things free. So if you really learn how to use Google Scholar with just a few words, it turns up a lot of junk always. But I strongly recommend it as for helping to search. Now, there was a student of, of um, Hilbert 
in uh, Göttingen in the 20s who had the idea that he should investigate. Uh, I mean, uh, Frege was 1880, 1890, this is 1920, should investigate uh, this kind of type-free theory of functions. And he wrote one paper on it. Uh, and unfortunately, he was uh, not a very stable person. Apparently, he went back to Moscow. And I think he died in an asylum uh, eventually there. But, and there's an English translation of his paper in the Van Hyenort volume, uh, if you want to go back to look at those things. But at the same time in Göttingen, you see in those days, we're talking about, about 1930, there weren't many PhDs in the States. People often went to Germany to do their PhD, especially in mathematics. Uh, and uh, Haskell Curry was studying there under Hilbert. And he thought of the idea about uh, type-free functions, but his motivation is really syntactical. He was trying to give a sort of algebraic foundation for substituting of one formula inside another formula, replacing a variable by some other expression and seeing what happens there. In fact, all his life, Haskell Curry was a totally syntactical person. He only believed, as far as I could make out, in symbol manipulation. His mathematics was all symbol manipulation. The other person who was like that, uh, who was only a symbol manipulator, was the Dutch computer scientist, Ad van Weingarde. He, through his personality, which was very, very strong, he created Algol 68. Algol 5058 was very popular, but then people realized that if you're going to use it on computers, languages need more features. And so Van Weingarten, who uh, started the uh, uh, Computer Institute in Amsterdam, thought that he would get the right kind of language, but it's very much based on symbol manipulation. I don't think people still understand everything he put in it. Apparently, there are many interesting versions of recursion, which are much stronger in the way that Van Gogh did than we usually teach uh, uh, today. Anyway, when the report for uh, Algo 68 came out, I was visiting Amsterdam and met up with uh, Van Weyckert. And I said, Ad, Ad, this report, you know, it was typed on an IBM typewriter. In those days, the IBM typewriters had a golf ball on it. Every time you wanted to change the font, you had to put a new golf ball on the typewriter. This report had a dozen different type fonts in it, I said. How did you have a secretary who could type anything like that? He said, oh, I have a secretary who does everything I want. <laughs> he typed it all himself. Totally amazing. But some people are motivated, I guess. <laughs> but those are the two most syntactical people I've ever met in my life. Now, I studied under Alonzo Church in Princeton for my PhD. and. He had an idea to solve the paradoxes from Frege, again, by having a sort of type-free theory of functions. And then it was discovered that the kind of function theory that he was working with was really the same as the kind that Curry was working with. And they were very close colleagues all their lives uh, there. But the lucky thing for uh, Church Two lucky things. Princeton has the Institute for Advanced Study. And the Institute brought Kurt Gödel from Vienna, just at the beginning of the Nazi times there, brought him to uh, Princeton, where he lectured on his incompleteness theorems. And Church had two students, uh, Stephen Claney and Barclay Rosser, who took very, very, very careful notes about Gödel's uh, incompleteness theorems. And that was really a key event. Now, Church felt that his 
lambda calculus, particularly as a logistic system, was really a perfect foundation for mathematics. Unfortunately, his two graduate students, Claney and Rosser, found the paradox uh, of it and proved that the logical part of it couldn't, couldn't work out. However, the function theory part of it was still good, and so Church wrote it up in the, his monograph in about uh, 41, wrote up the lambda calculus there. But I don't think he ever returned to that kind of lambda calculus. And when I was a student there, he would never talk about it. Other students asked him to do it. Church instead was very influential in writing about typed lambda calculus. And many people still use his extremely pedantic notation uh, uh, for it. But he was a super careful person, and the creation of the typed lambda calculus was very influential on many on many successive uh, logicians. But then what happened at uh, Princeton is that Gödel fell ill and returned to Vienna and then was trapped in Vienna and finally escaped across Siberia to Japan and to San Francisco and back to Princeton eventually uh, during the war uh, there. Uh, but he had given his lectures that Claney and Rosser very uh, carefully uh, wrote down. There's how he looked on the one side there at that time. I remember him very well. I knew him very well in Princeton. And he was always, especially with those kind of European glasses, very formidable when you were stared at through glasses like that. <laughs> um, but he could be very, very charming. But on the other hand, he had very... Uh, uh, very fixed opinions on a number of things, and it was hard sometimes to convince him uh, uh, of other points of view. And so Church tried to argue that lambda calculus was a good way to do computability because improving the incompleteness theorems, you have to think about computability of syntax, of uh, formulas that are, that functions that are needed for defining semantics and things like that. And so uh, it really became clear that you needed a theory of computability. The way it started out computability under, uh, under Hilbert, and uh, uh, there, uh, in the background materials you can find more information on it, but primitive recursive functions were the main thing. Primitive recursive functions were just those recursions, easy recursions based on passing from n to n plus one there. Then one of the students, uh, uh, students, Ackerman, discovered that there are double recursive functions that are not primitive recursive functions. And so people began to worry about, well, how many computable functions are there? They must go well beyond uh, the primitive recursive functions. And so that was a big issue of discussion during the time that Gödel was lecturing at Princeton as to what the scope of recursion uh, should be uh, primitive recursive functions, Gödel showed, were extremely powerful because all the syntactical operations he wanted to do via Gödel numbers could be uh, codified in terms of uh, primitive recursive functions. But they uh, really wanted to know what is the extent of uh, computability. And so through correspondence with the Dutch logician Erbron, Gödel and Erbron formulated a way of giving generalized recursions that are much stronger than primitive recursion, double recursion, triple recursion, things like that. You could have much, much uh, especially through uh, doing some kind of uh, perhaps endless search, you can, you can do much more powerful recursions. And so uh, Church said, well, but I can do that in my lambda calculus. And Gödel said, no, I don't think so and really didn't think that Church's lambda calculus was the right way. I will show you what Claney did in order to uh, solve that problem. So Church was so lucky to have these two amazing students, Steve Claney, whom I also knew uh, very well. I would say he's really the founder of uh, recursive function theory. And then the other one was J. Barclay Rosser, who worked also closely with uh, Church and Claney and different uh, things there, and he was a very, very influential uh, 
logician in the in the middle of the 20th century. So that's a little bit of background. I put in people I know, everybody except for Schoenfinkel and Turing, I knew personally. And so I put little potted biographies there for you and something about their, their role in there. So uh, you can read that on their own, but I'm not going to spend more time on it. Uh, at this point here. So let me go to thinking about what lambda calculus is, is. And so, again, the, qu the question is how to do it and why to do it. Maybe I should stop here for a moment. If anyone has a question or request or anything, do you have anything? Yes. What's the double return Okay. Well, it means uh, the function of two arguments. One argument you can pass from n to n plus 1. But then on the other argument, you can pass by what you did with that other argument through a bigger range of things. And so it isn't just a simple, if you, if you think of pairs of things, it isn't a simple kind of ordering that just goes step by step. It's something that goes back and forth between ranges of things. And so you get into to very long computations. And uh, you can generalize that further, too, in many ways. Any other question? Please, in the back. Okay, there are two questions there. What is it and why? So that's what we're going to do. Okay, so yeah. Jeremy, Jer Jer did you want to say something? Oh, just a comment about the double recursion. If I understand correctly, the Ackerman function would be a good example of one of those, right? Yeah, that was that's how he discovered uh, a non primitive recursive function. Mm -hmm. Yes? I thought that was in reference to structural recursion. I'm sorry? Oh, well, the thing is, people were thinking of various recursion schemes. And so Ackerman discovered that there was a scheme to define a function that is not primitive recursive. Uh, and it turned out to be double recursive. I mean, you, you sort of get in very quickly into iterated exponentials very quickly there and uh, doing long range computations. And it, it goes outside of primitive recursion. But I did want to get into details there. Any other questions? Do you like this kind of history thing yes. to So ask more questions uh, about it as we go along. OK, so what um, Curry did in saying what his uh, type-free theory of functions was, he said, I don't want to struggle with references to variables. I just want to have ways of combining things to get new things. OK? And so combinators make up combinations. And we'll see how they look. So Curry's combinators are S, K, and I. S stands for Schoenfinkel, because Curry never met Schoenfinkel, but he discovered his paper there and realized that Schoenfinkel's combinator was very important for his setup there. K is a combinator that stands for constant, and I is a combinator that stands for identity. And so the objective of getting these combinations here is You want to get a combinator which, when you apply it to a number of simpler combinations, gives you the eventual combination that you were looking for. So Curry's question is, 
I could just do that freewheelingly there, but maybe there are a finite number of combinators that generate everything we need. It wasn't obvious at first. He had to do a lot of working around with it. And so we'll see how that uh, comes about. Later on, when we think about modeling this, uh, I want to uh, also add arithmetic. I'll explain Church's arithmetic that Gödel didn't like. But later on, we'll have arithmetic as a primitive uh, thing to it to add to all of that. And so that'll come out uh, later. But first, let's just think about comb combinators. So these are the axioms that Curry um, put forward. The K combinator says, give me an X. I want to think of the function that has X as a constant value. So no matter what Y I think of there, K of X or Y is that cons given constant X. So any given constant can be turned into a function with constant values. Now, k of x and x are different because x is something or other. And k of x is the function that's constantly equal to x. So we have to be sure to uh, distinguish those. The identity function is just, yeah, the identity function. Now, what Schoenfinkel realized is that you can take that operation of, excuse me, my nose keeps running here in Boulder. You can take that basic thing of applying a function to an argument, and you can say, maybe I can parameterize the functions with a parameter and the arguments with a parameter. And so then I have a suite of applications of a function to an argument, parameterized by another parameter there. So the Schoenfinkel combinator there says, given two functions x and y, which can be evaluated by various parameters, Evaluate the first at the parameter z, evaluate the second at the parameter z, and then take that first value regarded as a function and apply it to that other value as the argument there. So application is parameterized by this combination. Now one thing that they wanted to do from the beginning, and which I'll argue against from the point of view of models, but it's still an interesting question, is are there are there only functions? If there are only functions in your universe there, then if x and y behave identically as functions for arbitrary parameters, they would have to be the same because everything is a function. I don't want to advocate everything as a function. You can model it very nicely in various ways, but I think there are easier models where you don't have to do that. In other words, Certain things behave as functions, but other things have other char chores to do as data uh, structures, and you don't have to. You don't have to insist on that axiom. But let's not emphasize that too much just here at the moment. So let's see. Uh, do I have to do it on the blackboard? Do I have to call for Jeremy here to come and uh, do it for me? Can you see that? Uh, that uh, SKK is equal to I. Why don't you try it on a blackboard? Ask it, somebody should ask a question. Maybe these are examples that you've done in uh, other ways. Question there. Um, I always see the, the SKI combinators together, but we can show that I can be derived from SK. Why do we include it in the statement? I'll answer that a couple of slides there because 
it's useful to have an extra constant around when you're eliminating variables and so. This, just to answer your question, this shows that I could have been replaced by a combination of S and K, so you don't need it as a primitive. Do you want to do? To work? You can do it on the chalkboard here. All right. Okay. This will, in some sense, you know, show what you were pointing out that they're equivalent, and you know, the, the answer why just for convenience. Okay. And I need that last axiom to make them identical. Just from the rules of expansion for combinators, you see the the basic axiom says, uh, if you're asked to expand something, then you do it according to the combinations uh, shown there either by erasing or by combining things together in a parameterized way. So if you start doing that. So we're going to use that equation up there. This is our, this is our x and our y and our z. So we'll have k applied to our z. I just added in an extra argument to show. We need three arguments on s to, to start working. We've got that. And then the y applied to z. that. Okay. So now we have, we need to look for places where k is applied to two arguments up there, to an x and a y. We have k applied to this argument and to that argument. And what that equation tells us to do is just to return the first argument. Right. And so in order to show that skk equals i, you need that, you need that uh, last axiom there uh, to do it. You can throw in all kinds of variables as parameters there, and then if things, after you undo them by the combination, they turn out to be the same, then you can say, oh, then the functions are the same. And so that's a popular way to do it. And now I'll leave this for you to think about there. Could s be equal to k if you try it out and try to take some combinations like over there? you'll get into the problem that any two x's and y's are equal. After you have, if s and k were the same, if s and k were the same, this is really a weird thing there. And so you'll see that you get into trouble there. And here is a nice one here. This is a combination of combinators. And you see by using i, it's shorter to write there. So this is the combinator that takes the first argument and then the second argument and applies one to the other. And so that's an example of finding a combinator that deals with the positioning of things. And that's what uh, Curry was trying to do, was how to substitute into formulas and get them to turn out in the right positions by, it's a kind of programming language in a way, giving you instructions about where you put things. Okay? Question? Question. Yes. Um, for, uh, for S uh, is not equal to K, um, if, I, if I played around with the combinators, right, uh, it would seem to me to be apparent that they're not equal, but could you suggest a heuristic uh, for what we might need to demonstrate in order to prove that they're not equal? Well, you see, in working with these equations, you can throw in, you can throw in extra arguments, free arguments, okay? So you can throw in a U and a V on some big combination there. Now, make up a combination which would just give you U as the answer the first time there. But if S were equal to K and you did it again, you would erase the u and get the v instead there. And so any two things would have to be equal if s were equal to k. So you'd be using that very first axiom? That first axiom would, would be. first axiom would, uh, is suggestive of that. I didn't want to give it all away because <laughs> you have to do it yourself to see how the things are. Now this is the algorithm for getting a rid of variables there, it says, if we have any combination, 
that does have some variables in it, we can find a combinator without any variables that just with the ducks in the line there takes the variables one at a time and puts them into the right place. And so then you get on the right hand side some monster combination M there involving all the X's and S's and K's and whatever else you want to put in for it. Okay? So the question is, how can I, given M, how can I systematically find a variable free combinator C that will put the variables back in the right place? Is the question clear? Okay, so here we'll do it one variable at a time. Eliminating x from m, that's what lambda means. Oh, two comments I should make on notation. Lambda was Church's notation, and we never could figure out why he used lambda. And so I asked his son-in-law uh, once, John Addison, please write your father-in-law and ask him why he chose lambda. So John wrote a postcard uh, to Church. Dear Professor Church, he always referred to his father-in-law as Professor Church. Dear Professor Church, Russell had the iota operator and Hilbert had an epsilon operator. Why did you choose lambda as your operator? So Church didn't write a letter back. He simply annotated the postcard, put it in an envelope and sent it back. And his annotation said, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> Many people have, especially Hank Barndrecht, has an argument that uh, the lambda notation arose typographically in the following way. In the Principia, Russell often wrote set abstraction by saying the set of all x having a property phi by using the circumflex in order to say I want to abstract the variable out of the property there. Now, the story that Barndrake tells, which is just false there, is that printers had a hard time printing the circumflex, so they decided to print it this way. And that didn't look too good, and so they changed the circumflex to look a little bit better and wrote it that way. And it's a nice theory, and I consider it absolutely false in any way. <laughs> Professor Church said, eeny, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> okay, so now, how do I eliminate x when m is x itself? Lambda x, x. Well, that's just the identity function. So we'll just say the elimination is the identity function. The first elimination means if x doesn't occur in m, we're thinking of the constant function m, so we can use Curry's k combinator. But now if m is a compound expression, oh, and here's something else I should say. Curry absolutely hated the fact that I use parentheses by using f of x, because he wrote it as Jeremy was writing it up here. Curry wrote application as a binary operation, and then he had elaborate rules for avoiding writing too many parentheses. Well, if you look at the mathematical literature, no mathematician understands functions like that notation. And so I decided in trying to explain it to people, it was better to use the ordinary functional notation. But now here is a problem, you see. F of x is a postfix notation, and lambda is a prefix notation, and prefix notations and postfix notations can get confused when you compound them over there. So formally, we really have to make lambda into a postfix notation with some extra parentheses on there. 
And that's particularly why Curry would hate it, because you get dozens and dozens of parentheses. Of course, machines can take any number of parentheses you want. But of course, it is annoying with paper and pencil. Now, uh, Dick de Brown was a close friend of Automath fame. He said, oh, well, the thing to do is to make lambda postfix notation. And then the postfix notations go together without additional parentheses. But of course, nobody can read it that way unless they are dyslexic, right? <laughs> so what can you do? I stick with postfix notations. Remember, sometimes I have to disambiguate what uh, I'm do doing there. And so that's what I did in the last uh, equation there. If S, if M is of the form P applied to Q, where P and Q are these big expressions, and the variable X can occur in many ways in them, then in order to eliminate X from M, First, you eliminate x from p, and then you eliminate x from q, and then you call on Schoenfickel to combine those two eliminations. And now if you go back and use our axioms, you see you haven't really harmed anything, because if you take a parameter on the outside and push it through, it'll come out uh, the right way. Maybe one more note about the notation here. We oftentimes think of lambda as a syntactic thing that constructs you know, a, a function. Here, we're, there's a pun going on. We're using the lambda x as a as the notation for, please remove this variable x, so this operator on combinators. Later on, we'll, we'll make lambda a thing of itself. Yes. Sort of Question. Pun. Question? It's a little bit tangential, but I, I read the paper compiling the categories. Mm -hmm. And um, there's this transformation where we eliminate lambda described in that paper, or where we Oh, that'll come up too. And in fact, category theory is type theory. Church's type theory is just a very special kind of category where you based everything on sets and sets and sets and sets. But category theory is the algebra of types. And so Church used lambda very extensively with his uh, logical type theory. And of course, uh, it's very, very closely uh, uh, involved in lots of category theory, especially when it comes up the so-called Cartesian closed categories have function spaces as a primitive in it, and to operate with those function spaces, you need something very much like lambda to do it. Different, different people have different kinds of notations there, but they're very closely related. My idea is category theory is type theory, but it is the generalized algebra of types, which is more than the logicians usually think of as types. So is that OK? Now, here's what uh, Church did, because he thought everything was so cool to ha just have uh, application. He said, look, I can do arithmetic uh, in an applicative uh, form here. So. Actually, Church didn't like to use the K combinator and zero, but he was afraid that he might fall in inconsistency, and he forced dear S Steve Cleaney to start his numerals from one and not have a zero there. But later on, people realized the zero doesn't hurt anything, and so I'm, I'm updating the uh, approach here. So the zero numeral means I'm thinking of a function f and I'm iterating it no times compo under composition. I'm composing it with itself no times at all. What do you get if you do no composition at all? You don't hurt the variable in the least. So that's the identity function. So the zero as a church numeral is that function which takes a function and returns the identity function. In other words, it's k of i k of i if you eliminate the variables there. I'm not eliminating the variables here because it quickly becomes unreadable, but it's perfectly easy to do. Now, successor function means, well, if I want to iterate a function f n times, 
f n plus 1 times. First, I should iterate at n times. And then I'm allowed to iterate it just once more. And therefore, I've iterated n plus 1 times. Now, if you want to do addition of iterations, and it turns out they're very short combinators will do it when you eliminate the variables from it, iterate f n times as a function, iterate f m times as a function, and then apply it to an argument. And then if you put n f's in front of all of that, you've just taken n plus m steps in iterating it. And as I said, if you eliminate the variables from that, it's, it's not a difficult combinator. And multiplication is very easy. Here I haven't written in any x. What I said is take, maybe if I use another notation here, that's more suggestive for iteration here. f squared of x equals f of f of x. OK? And so if I take f to the n applied to f to the m applied to x, of course, I get f to the n plus m applied to x. But now if I take f to the m as a function in itself and iterate it n times, I will get the result of doing m times n times. So Church saw that he could do addition and multiplication, and that didn't really cut any ice with Girdle because it's so elementary. And then his student Rosser said, wait a minute. Let's iterate the iterators. Here I was iterating some given functions. But an uh, iterator is just another function. Let's iterate the iterators. And so there's a very short notation for exponentiation there. But that was all the further that Church and Rosser got there. And uh, Gödel simply didn't see that the notation of lambda calculus even though it can do a certain amount of arithmetic, was really sufficient for doing recursive functions. So Claney, for his thesis, was given the uh, problem of developing arithmetic in Church's uh, system. And he made a lot of progress on it. Then, unfortunately, he and uh, Rosser proved that Church's logistic system was inconsistent. And so Claney had to shorten his thesis quite a bit there and just use the lambda calculus uh, part of it. But the, in order to do primitive recursion, you really have to find how to do the predecessor of an integer. It was easy to do n plus 1 or n plus m, but taking the predecessor was an obvious error, and Church didn't uh, think of it. After Claney thought of it and developed recursion there, Gödel had left Princeton and didn't know about the developments. And I'll tell you another amazing thing that Claney did as we uh, go along here. But here's the way that Claney said you can, uh, you can uh, do things. You see, with combinators in lambda calculus, you can combine things so that inside one combination you remember two given things. In other words, you can form pairs. Think of making some kind of data structure there. Just using this notation of combinators. I'm writing it in terms of lambdas here because it's easier to read. But think of making these combinations as data structures. But then when you put data together, later on you want to take it apart and get back to the components. So that's what you can do with simple lambda terms and combinators there. Pairing of x and y there is just saying, well, any function f 
would like to be applied to x applied to y. So because that function f is a variable, maybe if you replace f by certain combinators, you can regain x and y. And of course, it's obvious there, there are two combinators there. If in lambda f, f, f of x and y, you replace f by either one of those two things, then you'll cancel out and get either x or y. So that's a pairing function written in pure lambda calculus notation, and we could write it in terms of combinators. So just having a notation here for successor to, to move things ahead there. And then what we want to do is to take pairs and recombine them. So Kleene's idea was, hey, let's start out with the pair 0, 0, and then make the shift of taking 0 here and adding 1 to that one. And then the next time with this pair here, we have that data. So we can shift this over to this position, and we can take the successor to there. And we can continue doing that n times. And of course, what you'll get if you do it n times is on the top line, you will have added 1 n times. But on the bottom line, because you shifted from the previous result there, you have n minus 1. And so if you can make up these data expressions, you can see a simple-minded computational process where you keep track of what you wanted, and then you take out in the end. When you get the data finished, you can take out just the part that's significant there. And this was a key thing that Claney accomplished. You see, Gödel had shown with primitive recursion that you could manage all kinds of syntactical operations with Gödel numbering things. It takes a lot of arithmetic sometimes to write it all out, but it means that uh, integers themselves, after you factor or do something with it, can represent complicated amounts of data. Of course, any one integer is finite, but integers can number all kinds of things there. And so he used that very importantly in uh, doing the uh, incompleteness proof for, for arithmetic, because he showed that in first order arithmetic, you could uh, develop all the theorems about syntax uh, that you would need there to think about arithmetic as being uh, uh, a meta theory about syntactical computations like proofs in, in a logistic system. Well, what Claney showed was that lambda calculus expressions are just as good for representing data structures. I mean, just as good in a theoretical sense. I mean, it's sort of weird to try to code everything up as functions here, but the combinations are powerful, and you can think of a combination as data, which has lots of components, and then another combinator will tear out or replace or do something to make a new combination out of an old combination. And so he could see that you could do all the uh, programming of finite data structures in lambda calculus. That's the way I would describe it today. If only he could have told Gödel that. Gödel could have been convinced that Church's lambda calculus was powerful enough. But then we know what happened later with Turing and a different yeah. thing. Yeah. Yes? You asked me to keep an eye on the clock. Yeah, I think we'll have to take a break there. So let me just... Uh, there, um, we'll have more to come let me just uh, think ahead again. Okay, the next uh, two things, let me just say what's going to be. This was, uh, the last thing was the most elementary kind of recursion. By going from n to n plus 1, you can also go from n to n minus 1 there in terms of pairs. Okay, so now I'll talk about how you could have done all possible primitive recursive functions there. And then I'll show Kleene, you see, did it by saying, let's take these big data structures and think of things to do with them. 
And after we've done it for a long time, we say, oh, I'll just take out the leftmost piece of it, and that's the answer that I always wanted. That's a nice way to do recursion. You sort of implement all the memory of the machine that you have to have in order to do your computations. And by the time you finish the combination, the machine is very full, but you only have to read out one register to get, to get what you wanted there. That's a good way to do recursion sometimes. But then there's also a good way to do recursion in terms of recursion equations. And so I'll discuss the so-called fixed point combinator for doing recursions in lambda calculus. And then I'll say, why don't we consider lambda calculus as a theory in itself? Rather, you see, Curry started out just with the combinators, and lambda meant eliminate a variable. But maybe lambda in itself, as functional abstraction, has its own theory. And so we'll write down the axioms for that. So let's take a break. How long should we have, Jeremy? Well, maybe five minutes or so? Or? At least five minutes. OK, it's five past, so start coming back in at 10 past, OK?